Welcome to Real Vision. I'm Ed Harrison for Real Vision, and I have the distinct pleasure of speaking to Richard Ku of Namira Research, the chief economist there. Uh, Mr. Ku, great to talk to you. Oh, pleasure is mine too. You know, we spoke uh, right near the beginning of the crisis, uh, uh, this pandemic that we're in right now, and uh, a lot has happened since then. And so one of the reasons that uh, I'm talking to you, it's late uh, in Japan where you are and uh, early where I am here in the DC area, but um, a lot of things have happened and I wanted to get a sense for you what you're thinking now in terms of uh, this pandemic and the economic crisis that it's, uh, that's unfolded as a result of it. Uh, the 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 thing that uh, I found very interesting because you and I we spoke yesterday around the same time is when you said you wish that you were a doctor instead of an economist. Can you explain that comment? You know, this particular recession or pandemic is really coming from this very external source called coronavirus, and this is very. Uh, uncompromising virus. And so we learned over the last year that those countries that try to kind of balance between the virus and the economy virtually all failed. Only those economies that made no compromise actually succeeded. So we have a cases in Taiwan, New Zealand, Australia, where even the smallest increase in infections, wow, they go really after them to make sure that they don't spread. And Taiwan did that from the very beginning, just as when uh, this, this virus was spreading. And they apparently did a beautiful job of both mobilizing the entire population plus whatever the government can do. And so over this entire period, the number of infections in Taiwan, which is a country of 20, 23 million people is less than 900 for the entire period. And they have something like 250 days without a single domestic infection because they really did a good job at the beginning. And the, then New Zealand, Australia also did a very uh, strict lockdowns when it was necessary, made no compromises for the economy. And now they are doing great. Their economies are doing okay. I mean, all of these countries, of course, cannot really travel in, in and out because there's so many uh, sad cases outside, but at least as a country, they are able to uh, secure a safe life for, for the citizens and more or less normal economic activity. But all the other economies, uh, like United States, even Japan, European countries, these countries try to kind of balance between the two and it looked okay at the beginning in late spring, late spring when uh, lockdown succeeded in bringing the viruses down, but these countries end up leaving some around. And then we are now uh, suffering from the consequences. That virus came back uh, and then the economies have to shut down or have to slow down. But this is such a medical issue. So for for those of us economists, it's very difficult to tell what, what should we be watching out for. I mean, we, of course, we have to watch out for vaccine distribution, effectiveness of vaccine, all of these things, which we are not really trained to do. And it's very difficult to judge whether it's a Moderna vaccine is better than Pfizer or, or AstraZeneca and all these issues. But that will have huge impact going forward on which economy will come out of this earlier than others. And so sometimes I wish that I'm a doctor instead of an economist, because suppose, just imagine, you know, if this new variant turned out to be completely immune to the vaccines, you know, what, we can imagine what was gonna happen to our stock market, bond market, everything, because then we would be basically back to square one. Then we have to rewrite all of our forecasts, right? And so, being an economist in this this situation is not particularly assuring. Right, there's a, there's a lot of uncertainty there. And you know, yeah. it, what's interesting is, is that uh, you mentioned Taiwan. 
uh, when we spoke last time, you were in Taiwan. Yes, now yes. You're in Japan, right? Uh, what's uh, it, can you describe to me uh, the difference in in the two? Because obviously you mentioned Japan as well. Taiwan was a an actor that did really well. Japan isn't doing as well, from what you've said. What's going on in Japan, and why isn't Japan doing as well with the pandemic? Well, the key difference between two Japan and Taiwan is that Taiwan suffered from SARS uh, epidemic 17 years ago, and it hit the island very, very badly. It was so bad that many medical professionals refused to go to the hospitals because they were so afraid that they're going to catch this thing. And so after that very sad experience where something like 87 people died, they really learned the lesson. And so this time, when uh, it was the Taiwanese who first reported to WHO, even though you know Taiwan was not part of WHO, that there's a, a horrible virus spreading in China. And WHO didn't take it very seriously, but Taiwanese did. And even though that was just before the Chinese New Year, where all these Chinese start traveling, Taiwanese included, and many ta Taiwanese businessmen were working in China. They were all coming back to Taiwan, some of them from Wuhan. So the panic was really real. But they um, put it in such a way that uh, when you come back, you have to go through two weeks uh, quarantine. And that quarantine was a very tight one. If you step out of your apartment even once, even one foot out, that's 3,000 US dollars fine. And if you do it multiple times, it goes to $300,000 <laughs> very, very quickly. And suppose you don't report to the authorities uh, for some length of time, they can actually foreclose all of your properties, whether it's real estate, shares, whatever bank account you have. And with that kind of uh, very strict measures together with uh, mobilizing the entire national resources to provide masks. I mean, Taiwan had no masks when that happened because it was all produced in China and it wasn't, the masks were no longer uh, coming to Taiwan. They put together this mask production in like three weeks time from zero to 10 million in three weeks with no machines at the beginning. And with that kind of national effort, putting together kind of national team of people, you know, can you make this, this piece of the machine that we need? Can you make that piece of the machine that we need? And then you put them all together and then they start um, making these masks. Japan didn't do any of that. Right. Japan just waited like so many other countries for somehow mass production to pick up. And I think these steps, allow Taiwan to do it very well and allow didn't allow other countries to 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 get to that uh, stage. What makes it even more difficult for Japan is that Japanese laws are kind of a reaction to World War II in that until August 15, 1945, when Japan surrendered, Japanese government, or should say Japanese military, had enormous power over the people. With one little postcard, your life is determined because then you have to go drafted into the army and so forth. So Japanese law after that is the opposite extreme. Government really cannot tell people not to do this, not to do that. It's very lenient. And so even though they ask you to stay for uh, two weeks quarantine, just like in Taiwan, there is no penalty for not obeying that rule. And so naturally, most people tend to walk out, have a uh, fresh sunlight and things like that. And then the things began to spread. Uh, so I think the key difference is the SARS experience. Japan was not affected by SARS. United States wasn't affected by SARS. And so they were caught off guard whereas Taiwan, together with many other Eastern Asian countries uh, like Hong Kong and, and Vietnam, they were affected by SARS. So they know what to expect from the virus coming out of China. Since you're in Japan, I think th this is a good uh, case where we can uh, make the transition from uh, the epidemiology and all of those measures to the economy, because I know 
you've thought of, okay, so what if Japan did what Taiwan did at various points in time? How much would it cost the economy and to get to where Taiwan is today, to where New Zealand and uh, is today? Uh, walk us through the, the numbers on that, both uh, had they done it uh, from the beginning and also if they tried to do it now? Well, uh, I looked at how long it would have taken to really eliminate the virus in the spring of last year if they kept on uh, extending the pandem- uh, sorry, lockdown. And it seems that for Japan, uh, Germany, Italy, France, for those four countries, if they extended their lockdown three more weeks to whatever they did, their number would have really gone to zero. But because of the economy, uh, they really, you know, they re- reduced the lockdown measures just prior to it. And then of course the virus starts spreading again. So if you add the original, let's say six weeks plus additional three weeks, uh, how much GDP would have you would have sacrificed? And in the case of Japan, for the for the spring of last year, it comes out to be about thirty trillion yen. So Japan's GDP is about five hundred trillion. So it's like six percent of Japan's GDP. What that means is that if they're willing to absorb that shock, or you do. Uh, you know, 60, uh, 30 trillion yen of fiscal stimulus to help those people who are affected by the lockdown, then Japan could have come out of that and then enter the world like, you know, where Taiwan or New Zealand uh, is, <coughs> uh, New Zealand are. But because even though they did the lockdown for the first three we- uh, six weeks, they didn't do the remaining three, we are suffering so much now. Uh, so it's it's a matter of how political leaders decide on the spot. Of course, at that time, we didn't know much about this virus to begin with. Right. So we cannot really blame them for making all those decisions. But this time around, uh, I hope they take these uh, numbers more seriously, that this is something, even without vaccines, uh, we should be able to control if we are willing to pay the price. And even though the price tag is high, and and this time because the number of infections are so much larger than in the spring, at least in the case of Japan, it's not going to be 30 trillion, it's probably like 40 or maybe even 50 or 10% of Japan's GDP. But after that, when everything returns to normal, then people will be so much more relaxed. They'll probably spend a lot of money that they were forced to save during those lockdown periods and the economy should do a lot better. And so what the lessons we learned during the last one year is that there is really no trade-off between the virus and the economy. You just have to kill the virus off completely before economy can uh, recover. And if we continue to believe that there's some sort of a a trade-off, we may end up losing more GDP on a cumulative basis than if we just went ahead and and eliminated these guys uh, from the very beginning. You know, when you uh, went through that, uh, there was a few countries that come to mind that weren't in your analysis there. And I'm figuring you had a reason. Uh, You know, the first two that come to mind are the U.S. and the U.K. Yes. Uh, So when you talk about the U.S. or the U.K. becoming like New Zealand, becoming like uh, Taiwan, why is it that you didn't talk about them and you talked about uh, Japan? Well, Japan and European countries, they really did the lockdown with all the right pieces. That is to say, everybody should wear a mask and, and things like that, wash hands and uh, social distancing. But unfortunately, in the United States, we had a president who didn't believe in any of that stuff and didn't encourage people to uh, wear masks, even made this mask and the, kind of a political issue. And so if you look at the number, how much uh, infection numbers came down in the spring of last year, it, of course it came down a little bit, but it stayed at a relatively high level. 
and then start growing again. It really didn't go close enough to do the kind of analysis that I was uh, sharing with you just, just earlier. And the UK did a little bit better job, but still uh, compared to the other four, the three European countries and Japan, uh, I think if people in the UK wore masks like the other four, then maybe we can make this kind of analysis. Uh, we can do some estimates for the UK as well. From everything that you just said, it sounds to me like it's almost as if the US or the UK, uh, for that matter, could not get to the New Zealand level. I, you know, I'm thinking about what if we wanted to wipe out the virus and go back to normal in the way that Taiwan and New Zealand have done, uh, what would we need to do? It sounds like you're saying that, especially in this day and age where we have massive COVID fatigue, that the the amount of viral contagion that's in this system would require so long of a lockdown that it would be very difficult to employ that. Yes, I'm afraid so. Uh, so for the United States to go that route, maybe we have to prepare sacrificing maybe 10, 15% of GDP to, to get there. And all the citizens will have to follow the rules so that it's not just the government talking about locking down, but people actually are practicing all the necessary steps. And that may be difficult with uh, COVID fatigue that you mentioned. But the flip side of that is that if you're willing to do it, we can get there. And if that with a with a new president who seems to be a lot more concerned about this issue than the previous one, if he you know leads the people correctly, maybe we can get something close to it. Maybe not entirely to the New Zealand level or the Taiwan level, but certainly better than what we are stuck with now. Right. Well, let, let's talk about the uh, the economic uh, responses to the pandemic and. Uh, w how you've uh, been thinking about it as compared to, say, the great financial crisis. When you look at uh, how well fiscal and monetary agents have done across the globe in terms of dealing with the crisis, compared to the last crisis we had, which you're famous for because of your deleveraging, your balance sheet recession uh, narrative that many people understood to be happening in that recession, how do you think that we fared? How have we done? Well, uh, this time around, I think the economic responses, including those from the United States and UK, were very good compared to the last one. As early as April, United States had what $3 trillion uh, package. That's a huge package when you think about it. And then it was implemented very quickly. Some people got their checks uh, within uh, within two, two weeks of the actual implementation of the, of the package. That's amazing speed. And if you compare that three trillion package in the United States this time, last year with what was happening after 2008, when President Obama came on board, he tried to put in a massive fiscal package and we thought that was pretty big package, but that was only $787 billion. Right. And at that time, that's and that's for two years package. So it comes out to be about 2% per year, 2% of GDP per year. But at that time, how much wealth did we lose as a result of what happened to both the real estate market and in, in the stock and uh, subprime uh, mortgage market? I mean, $10 trillion, $15 trillion of wealth was lost. And the package to fight that was only $787 billion. <laughs> Naturally, that was not enough. And furthermore, because of what happened to uh, asset prices back in 2008, all these people who leveraged themselves up during the, uh, the bubble days, they realized that the, the liabilities are still up here. This thing hasn't changed. Asset prices collapsed, but they had their balance sheets underwater. They're all trying to repair their balance sheets, which is the right thing to do at the individual level. But when everybody does it all at the same time, we enter this you know, fallacy of composition problems. 
because in the national economy, someone has to be, if someone is saving or paying down debt, you need someone else on the other side borrowing and spending money. And usually the financial sector will be in the middle, taking the money from the savers, giving it to someone who can use it to make sure the economy goes forward. But at that time, everyone was saving money or repairing balance sheets. No one was borrowing money, even at zero interest rates. And that's how you get into this, what I call the uh, balance sheet recession, where economy gets worse and worse and worse. At the height of that uh, balance sheet recession, US private sector as a group was saving something like 10% of GDP. Uh, private sector meaning household, corporates, and financial sectors taken together. If private sector is saving 10% of GDP, government has to borrow 10% of GDP to keep the economy going. And the 2% package, I'm afraid it was not enough. And that's why we ended up with this very deep recession for such a long time. And the 787 after two years was not renewed either because of the opposition from Republicans who wanted the smaller government. In fact, they actually wanted to reduce the deficit. And it was because of the great work by people like Chairman Bernanke of the Fed, uh, Vice Chair Yellen at the time, who warned the congressmen and the senators that if you fall off the fiscal cliff, we'll be all dead. And their effort kept the Congress from actually going to reduce the deficit, but that they did not succeed in adding to the, to the deficit uh, so that this uh, fiscal package can continue. But this time around, you know, by December, we had another 900 billion package. And so I think economic response this time is far better than the response we, we saw last time. And because of this huge fiscal package, plus um, a monetary easing by the Fed on both occasions, but because this time it was matched with the fiscal policy, we didn't see asset prices collapse. I mean, we, thought, we saw that in early, early March, but things began to recover. Now our share prices are <laughs> almost all time high. Some of the uh, real estate prices are also recovering as well. So we didn't get into this, this balance sheet uh, problems that we got into last time around. And so medical responses, especially in the U US and UK were pretty bad, I'm afraid, but the economic responses were very good. Yeah, and you know, so that puts us in a, in a relatively good position, you could say on some levels, uh, for, given the fact that we're now in a period where we have the vaccine. Uh, you know, multiple vaccines in some cases, in some countries uh, that people have access to. And so, you know, financial markets are looking through sort of the malaise that we're in now toward uh, the end of the tunnel uh, when we can get to a period where, you know, people uh, are able to go out and, and act relatively normally. So, you know, my question for you, I guess, is, is, is that... Uh, how do we manage this period the best, uh, you know, between now and when maybe we can actually uh, return to a, a normal, a new normal? Uh, what do we do from an economic policy perspective? Well, since all the fiscal package that we'll put in is to allow the companies to survive so that when the medical problem is behind us, they can come back and do what they are good at. So until vaccination is more or less complete, since we already spent what, $4 trillion already, if we pull the plug now, allow companies to go bankrupt, and then six months later, vaccination is finished, economy won't be able to recover because so many companies will be dead, banks are filled with non-performing loans and all that, kind of, all that kind of stuff. So I think for the next six months, I think we have to maintain this uh, financial support to those companies and workers who are affected by lockdowns and, and the pand pandemic. Once we get to the other side and when things begin to return to normal, I would imagine that there'll be a couple of months, three to six months, where suddenly people think they can spend the money. And when that happens, of course, you're all waiting for that, for that day, uh, I'm sure economy will bounce back very strongly. Uh, We'll be all partying the streets, traveling, and so forth. But after that, 
what kind of economy are we returning to? And the economy we were in exactly a year ago, before this pandemic got really bad, was still an economy where private sector was saving a lot of money. In fact, if you look at the data, US private sector was still saving something like 5% of GDP. Even with zero interest rates, even with unemployment right down to 3.5%, people are still saving money. So I think what happened after 2008 really made people realize that you have to have a strong balance sheet. You don't want to, you don't want to be caught without savings and, and so forth. So if we do return to that world, then we, will, we might still see Americans saving money, a European savings money. And if that's the case, it will be somewhat similar to the balance sheet recession kind of world. Even with low interest rates, people may be replenishing their savings that they depleted during the pandemic. And if that's the case, fiscal policy might still have to play a role in case the private sector as a group is a net saver, then someone has to borrow money to keep the economy going. And so once we get to that point, uh, I think fiscal authorities should remain vigilant that if it's necessary, they put in an, uh, uh, fiscal measures to make sure that economy will not fall into a deflationary spiral just because everyone is trying to rebuild their savings that they depleted during the, during the pandemic. And at that point, the nature of fiscal stimulus will have to be changed also. During the pandemic, it's this you know, direct payments to the citizens and to the companies because we cannot do anything else, especially during lockdown. But once we are out of this, then the nature of fiscal policy will have to be changed to more like public works instead of paying money to the people. Because if you just pay money to the people, they will use that to replenish their savings and it will not be helpful for the, to maintain a GDP. Right. You know, th this uh, uh, savings replenishment is interesting because I believe that if you look at the uh, savings rate, you know, it skyrocketed at some point in the United States to, uh, you know, 30%. So, you know, putting uh, that, that's during the pandemic. It, 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 so, putting uh, what happened before uh, together with the pandemic and thinking about what happens after, it doesn't really paint that good a picture. L let me tell you how I'm looking at it and tell me if this makes any sense, that, okay. you know, before the pandemic, you were saying that, uh, you know, people were still deleveraging, you know, years into a, a, a recovery where we had 3.5% unemployment. Uh, and then they were hit with this shock of a pandemic. Some of them were still caught out and therefore, you know, the savings rate went way up. When you look at the corporate side of things, people, you know, many companies were, uh, they were leveraging up and then buying back shares with that, uh, that leverage uh, in order to make their stock prices go up. And then the pandemic hit. And when March 2020 came around, there was such panic in the streets that many of these companies could have gone bankrupt. And now, you know, they're probably a bit chastened as a result of that. So, you get the vaccine, you come out the other side, it doesn't seem like either the, the corporate or the household sectors are going to be in an excited mood over the long term. Maybe there's that, that, that window of partying you know, at the beginning, but it doesn't seem like over the long stretch, either side is going to be doing great things. Well, uh, I agree with you in that all these people who suffered most during this pandemic are the ones who didn't have enough savings. And you know, just before this pandemic, the, the mood in Wall Street and around the world among the financial types was that if you have additional savings or uh, hoarding cash, that's a bad thing to do. That there's not a opti sub, that's a suboptimal use of capital. They should be fully invested or just give money back to the shareholders or buy back your shares. That was the prevailing mood for both households and the businesses. And government often went on after the companies that had a lot of cash hoarding and says, maybe we should put tax on that stuff. You know, that kind of debate was uh, quite popular among economists. 
Right. But after this event, it's those companies that had those cash that survived and are those that didn't have, of course, went down the drain or needed horrendous government help. So I think the culture uh, of people would change after this by saying, no, uh, even if it's not the most optimal use of capital at the moment, we should still have some money that we can access when something like this happens again, a second wave, third wave, you know, how many more waves that, of mutations we're going to get out of this vaccine. So the kind of uh, what was popular just a year ago might not be popular for years to come, especially borrowing money to buy back your own shares. That may be great for the shareholders for that moment, but that will weaken the uh, resili financial resilience of these companies for, for the long haul. And I don't think those activities should be encouraged uh, going forward. You know, the one missing element to all of this, I think that a lot of people are, are thinking about are central banks. Because during the great financial crisis, as you mentioned, they lowered interest rates to 0% and then started buying financial assets. Uh, and that's something that they're doing now, uh, both interest rates at zero, but in some places negative and uh, buying financial assets. Do you think that's going to continue uh, during uh, this uh, pandemic period and potentially afterwards? As a former central banker myself, I'm really opposed to central bank basically financing budget deficits. And during the balance sheet recession, the world that existed until about a year ago, that was not necessary either. So I was actually opposed to quantitative easing because the reason government had to do fiscal stimulus is because private sector saving too much. So why should the government should just borrow the excess savings in the private sector and use it instead of rely on the central bank? That was my stance all along. And I was often criticized by people like Paul Krugman that why can't central bank just come in and support this whole process? That would be even better. But my argument was that you know, the central uh, government should borrow from the private sector first instead of crowding the private sector out of the uh, capital markets uh, for the, from the government bond market by, uh, uh, by the central bank. But this time, this is a very urgent situation. I mean, private sector cannot come up with you know, $3 trillion in two weeks. So this is the part the central bank must help. And I think they did a beautiful job doing it. And basically, the financial market could become very tight in a situation like this, right? People were uh, this saving for those people are affected. If, if there were no government help, people would be dissaving to make the ends meet because they don't have any income. Companies would be coming in to borrow the uh, working capital just to stay alive. So the financial market, without government help, without central bank help, would have been very, very tight. But luckily, the central bank came in with lots of money, and that's what's keeping uh, both the markets, together with all the uh, asset markets basically uh, alive. And I think that should continue all the way until medical sol solutions are fully in place. Because this is one of those, you know, uh, time where you need huge sum of money very quickly. And the central bank is the only place that can provide that kind of money. And I don't think we have to worry about inflation in any way, because if the central bank didn't do this, we would be falling into this horrible deflationary uh, spiral with bankruptcies, job losses, and then more bankruptcies and more job losses. So the fact that central bank came in, uh, I think, was, was the right thing to do. But then your question would be, well, what would you do with all this extra money in the system after we come out of this thing? And I'm not too worried about that because if, if you and I are right, of course we may be wrong, but if we are right about how people will react after all of this, after the six, three to six months party, that they want to replenish their savings, that they depleted during the uh, pandemic, they just want to make sure that they have enough savings in case something else happens in the future. If that move takes place, 
private sector will be could become a net saver again, just like the world we were in before uh, pandemic. And if the private sector becomes a net saver, they need a place to invest their place their money. Right. At that time, if the central bank start to undo uh, quantitative tighten in the QT, undo whatever excess reserves they put in during the pandemic, uh, and they try to retract it, how do you retract that? Well, you sell the bonds. Then the private sector, the private financial institutions who cannot find people to borrow money will be happy to buy, happy to buy government bonds or even corporate bonds that central bank might be selling. And so they should be able to normalize monetary policy during that period. And if that happens, then we really don't have to worry about inflation either. So I think central banks should be doing whatever they can at this moment, knowing with a reasonable prob probability that they can normalize this monetary policy afterwards. You know, when you say central banks can uh, should be doing whatever they can, obviously that opens the door to uh, a lot of things that they could do. And I, I, when when I spoke to you briefly yesterday, I talked I talked to you about three things that people are talking about, uh, and I want to get your sense on whether you think these are legitimate activities beyond what they're doing now. Uh, the one is yield curve control, where they uh, give a target for a, a five-year or a 10-year rate, as an example. The second is the purchase of, say, uh, junk bonds, uh, individual uh, junk bonds, or equities. And then the third is uh, the, the creation of uh, digital currencies, you know, central bank digital currencies, it's all the rage uh, in terms of people, different banks, even you know the bank of uh, the the Reichsbank in Sweden is uh, looking into that. Are those measures that you think uh, are legitimate? Uh, and if 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 so, uh, why would they be legitimate? I think they are doing as much as they should be doing. <clears throat> and the three that you mentioned, uh, for example, yield curve control was first introduced by the Bank of Japan because they ran out of uh, basically securities to buy. They were buying 80 trillion yen per year. Well, the Japanese GDP is 500. Then you buy 80 trillion a year. Of course, you ran out of uh, JGBs to buy. <clears throat> and it wasn't doing much good either to the economy because inflation rate uh, never picked up. And that's because Japanese private sector as a group was a huge net saver, still repairing balance sheets. And so even if you do uh, yield curve control, it looks like you're doing something. But you know, just a few basis points here, basis points there, it's not gonna make all that much difference. Uh, I mean, those of us in the financial sector gets a little excited when central bank comes up with something new and then see you know, which way can we make money and things like that. But I think it's a very small piece of the uh, picture. And I don't think it will add much in one way or the other. The other one, the junk bonds, for investable grade bonds, the yield today is actually lower than the yield in February of last year, right. right? Yeah. When you think about it, uh, the credit ratings much, much lower, profitability much, much lower. How could bond yields be that low? That's because central bank did so much for them. And I don't know whether the central bank should do more. I think they have done enough, perhaps a little bit too much. I mean, uh, as a former employee of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, my instinct is that this time is kind of overkill already. Right. But I don't blame them for doing it. If I were in the issues, I would have done the same thing. Because if you are faced with this massive uncertainty, which has to do with medical issues and not economic issues that you can kind of uh, get, your, get your hand on, then it's better to overkill than you don't do enough and the things collapse. So I, I, I have absolutely no complaints about what the Fed did during this time, even though, you know, five, 10 years later, we could say, oh, that was, well, was too much. But at that time, that's the right thing to do, given right. what they know. And a digital currency, uh, 
if digital currency here means we do away with private sector banks altogether and all the clearing uh, settlement will go through our account, in, individuals have account at the Federal Reserve, then maybe something can be, uh, for example, if government wants to give us money, wow, they can just give you money in two seconds instead of waiting for two weeks. Right. But that benefit of two, day, uh, two minutes instead of two weeks and replace all the infrastructure we created over all these years, uh, I don't know whether it's all that beneficial. I mean, absolute emergency case where private sector banks are incapable of performing their clearing uh, functions. It might be good to have something like this on the side, but when US Treasury could distribute money after the bill passed the Congress, and only two, two weeks later, people were able to get their money on their bank accounts. I think that was fast enough. And if, if you know, without that, it took two months, there may be something like digital currency where the central bank can just push the button and everybody gets the money on the spot. That may be useful, but if you can do it in two weeks, I, I don't think digital currency is all that necessary. But I may be wrong, you know, things might <laughs> change in the future. <laughs> Well, you know, uh, I think that there's been a, uh, a push. There, there are people who have said, actually, you know, the digital currency, one of the great things is, is that we can give money directly. We can target it to different groups of people who need it uh, by giving them accounts. And then we can charge negative interest rates, uh, you know, penalty rates for their not spending the money. So therefore, we know that the money is being spent uh, for certain purposes, and if it's not spent, then uh, it evaporates and goes away. So we can it, we can take interest rates which are negative in places like uh, Europe and make them even more negative: five percent, ten percent negative interest rates. You know, I'm no great fan of negative interest rates. I'm afraid uh, negative interest rates is like you try to make you. Uh, creating artificial inconvenience for the people. Right. And then you force them to spend money. Uh, if you put something like that, all these people who got their money on the bank account may immediately go get some gold or silver, or whatever, uh, precious metals. And it that's that would be even more distorting in my view. I think it's better to... Uh, give so-called safe assets so that people don't have to worry about money disappearing tomorrow and then start spending money on all sorts of silly things. I think people will need peace of mind more than anything else in the circumstances like this. And uh, what do you think, uh, by the way, of the difference between, uh, say, uh, of the Fed, you know, they're appointed, uh, they're not uh, directly elected, uh, doing things with monetary policy and elected officials uh, using fiscal policy. I, I mean, I think there are two parts to that. One is a philosophical argument about, you know, people who are directly elected and others who are not. And then the second part is the efficacy of fiscal policy versus monetary policy. Well, that's a very long debate behind what you just mentioned. Uh, in terms of efficacy, uh, monetary policy is far superior because you only need the uh, the chairman or chairwoman plus a few governors at, at the table in Washington, D.C., uh, Constitution Avenue, and then you get the policy in place. Whereas fiscal policy, wow, well, you have to go through this co congressional procedures, House of Representatives, uh, senators, and you have to decide what to spend on, who gets the money, and all of that. And that so it typically takes much longer, many months before the money is actually spent. And so the preference of economists over the years is that the monetary policy should be the, the key tool to handle economic fluctuations. But unfortunately, if the private sector for any reason are not borrowing money, 
whether they want to replenish savings after the pandemic or because their balance is underwater after the bursting of the bubble, if they're not borrowing money, I'm afraid monetary policy is completely useless because monetary policy is basically giving money to the banks, but for the money to come out of the banking system and enter the real economy, banks cannot give away money. It has to lend money. And if there are no borrowers, the money gets stuck. And that's what we see all around the world after 2008. The monetary base skyrocketed, but the uh, lending to the private sector remained more or less flat. Money supply only grew very, very slowly. And so I don't think I put too much emphasis on monetary policy during a times like that. But right now, during pandemic, where people need the money very desperately, uh, monetary policy has to play a role, a, a huge role. And I'm glad that all the central banks are doing it correctly. And on the political side there, with regard to you know uh, the elected officials, because I think that the uh, one of the things that people talk about is that uh, there is a, um, how can you put it, a uh, technocratic, uh, you know, especially in Europe, they talk about the technocrats and the ECB dictating things. It's even more severe there, obviously, because you have a mismatch between, you know, the hierarchy where the 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 ECB sits and the and the member states. But even in the United States, where it's level, there's still that debate. I think that the debate is a valid one. Uh, for the longest time, until March of this year, uh, March of last year, Federal Reserve did not want to buy corporate bonds. Because by buying certain corporate bonds and not the others, it gives you know the credibility to certain companies and not to the others. And that's not the kind of business the central bank should be in. And so w- when I was at the Fed many years ago, you know, that was one of the first things that we were taught to, to believe in, uh, to uh, make sure. But this time around, because the situation was so dire, Federal Reserve actually stopped buying corporate bonds, right? First through the ETC, and then finally buying the, the actual bonds. Uh, I'm still ambivalent about whether that was a good thing to do, but under the circumstances, as I said earlier, this is where overkill is better than uh, doing not enough. Right. And I think the Federal Reserve going that far probably calmed the markets down. And I'm no great fan of doing that, but I think it served a purpose. But it's, it served the purpose only in the emergency situation like the one we are in now. Under ordinary circumstances, I don't think federal uh, central bank of any country should be involved in, in making decisions which bonds to buy and which bonds you don't buy. Right. And, and you know, um... Uh, in one of your last answers, you mentioned gold and silver. I thought that was interesting because, uh, you know, even though you're an economist, uh, uh, what you're saying shows the relationship to financial markets. And obviously, you're a market economist because you work at Namura. Uh, what do you see as the relationship between what's happening now in terms of the monetary and fiscal policies and also in the real economy? and uh, where asset prices are going and where other uh, 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 currencies and and gold and silver in particular are going? Well, uh, gold prices are being quite high. And I think it comes from the following sequence of events. When this thing hit, Central Bank did what we just discussed, right? Massive injection of reserves and uh, bringing interest rates down to very low levels, even buying corporate bonds, uh, buying lots of government bonds. And usually, if the central bank appears to be financing government budget deficit, in the past, those countries suffered massive loss of credibility and hyperinflation, currency cor- collapsing. Well, usually currency collapse first, and then the hyperinflation infl- followed. But this time around, that did not happen at all, even though so many central banks are doing it, buying government bonds. And why 
this time it was okay to do it when in the past that often ended up in tears with hyperinflation and horrible consequences. Well, this time around it's pandemic and not epidemic. In the pandemic, all the central banks are forced to do the same thing. So suppose you hear the central bank buying government bonds, supporting a budget deficit, you want to move your money out and then maybe move to some other currency. Well, where do you bring your money to? Everyone is doing basically the same thing. I mean, some small countries, well, Taiwan or New Zealand, but you know, they're too small to move uh, any amount of money over. So gold is one place where people could place their money. If you think that at some point we might get, get a horrible inflation, hyperinflation, you put money in your gold. Bitcoin is the other one. Uh, that's one place where you can put the money in. But even with Bitcoin going up, even with gold going up, that doesn't mean inflation rate is going to go up at all. Because first of all, no, uh, none of these things are denominated in gold. <laughs> and because everyone is, do, all the central banks are doing at the same time, it actually gives individual central banks more leeway in their policy response. If you're the only one doing it, you might see your currency collapse, but with everybody doing it, that risk is, is minimized. And that's one of the few, I don't know, the positives that one could <laughs> talk about during the pandemic, because that gives central banks additional leeway, additional uh, reason to, to do more. You know, I, I want to end our conversation uh, talking a little bit then about your forward-looking view on markets. We already talked about your forward-looking view uh, on the economy, where you talked about the potential for precautionary savings. You talked about the reemergence potentially of a balance sheet recession uh, that we had previously. What, is, what do asset markets look like in, the, in, in that future? Uh, I'm thinking principally of, uh, you know, because of inflation, which you just mentioned, I'm thinking of bonds. I'm thinking of, uh, you know, gold, silver, Bitcoin, as you were mentioning, and then also equities as well. Oh, well, uh, I don't produce so, those forecasts because that's done by Nomura Securities and not by us in Nomura Research. But if we enter a world where people are beginning to replenish their savings, so after the six months party, people start returning to normal world, and the normal world is the world that existed until January of last year, then interest rates will be still low. And if interest rates are low, that will support some of the asset, asset prices. But interest rates are low because people won't be borrowing money, they'll be saving money. That's why interest rates will be low. Governments may also be tempted to reduce their deficit because it, it grew to such a large number during this uh, pandemic. I hope they don't try to reduce it too quickly for the reason I mentioned to you earlier, if the private sector as a group turn out to be a net saver. The government has to borrow the money and keep the economy going. But the uh, pressure is there from conservatives, Republicans, whoever, there's all oh, the bu our budget deficit, public debt is too large, let's reduce it. And all that prevents interest rates from rising, right? Uh, and so even though I believe asset prices now are at least in some asset classes are overpriced. Some are horribly overpriced. <laughs> uh, but if this kind of world remains, if we return to the world we were in uh, until January of last year, it's not going to be a major change. And if, if for a major change to actually happen in the dynamics of all, all of this. For example, President Biden says, okay, let's really invest on clean energy. And we get a lot of uh, incentives, tax cuts, whatever. So if you invest in clean energy and if the private sector as a group become a huge net borrower of funds to meet all these uh, climate change challenges, then interest rates might start rising. And at that point, 
all those asset classes that were dependent on this low interest rate environment will have to go through some adjustment. Well, uh, you know, I, I'm going to leave it there. There's there's so much more that we could talk about. I, I, I appreciate your taking the time. And well, maybe we can have another conversation once we're closer to the tail end, which hopefully, you know, with fingers crossed is this year of, of the, the vaccine rollout. And we can get your view at that particular juncture as to uh, where we are. Okay. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, actually, but <laughs> and the economy gets a lot better. But at the moment, that's that's my best thinking at the moment. Well, I appreciate it very much, and thank you for doing this interview with us, uh, oh, Mr. Ku. Thank you. Always a pleasure. Okay, let's talk again soon.